the press Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Times discourse in Matthew 24 portrays three themes just by a little bit of review. The first is the theme of deception. The end times will be viciously deceptive. The deception will have three characteristics a tendency by God's people to misorder the events of the end times, <coughs> the religious nature of the leadership in the end times, and the deception that's inherent in the mystery of lawlessness, the tendency of the human heart <coughs> toward evil, deceptive in itself. <coughs> the second theme that Jesus presents is the theme of persecution. It'll be a persecution of the elect, a war on the saints, and a temporary overcoming of them. The Bible says that there'll be two main pressure points in this war on the saints. One will be the pressure to cave into the worship of the image of the beast. And the second will be the unrelenting economic pressure of not being able to to buy or sell, apart from having the mark of the beast. The scriptures indicate that most of the church will be killed during those dark days. The third theme that Jesus presents in his end times discourse is the theme of victory. And this is the theme that we'll look at today. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I'm just so glad that you've given us your word and that we can read the end of the story. And even though we live in the midst of its pages right now, Lord, we know the outcome. And we know you're coming back. And we know that you will be victorious. I pray, Father, that you teach us to order our days rightly, that we might present ourselves to you with a heart of wisdom. Pray, Father, that you'd help us to live in faith, that we would not be among those that fall away, but, Lord, that we would be faithful to the end. So Lord, I ask this morning that you bless the consideration of your word, that you change us, that you teach us, in Jesus' name. In keeping with our basic approach to understanding the end times writings, we'll look first and foremost at Jesus' word. And then we'll use those as the, as the benchmark or the lens through which we'll interpret all the other end times literature, <coughs> biblical and non-biblical. So let's look at Jesus' words in Matthew's account of his end times discourse concerning the theme of victory. <coughs> But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Notice Jesus keeps after this ordering of the events. Immediately after. And notice that the unthinkable happens. 
as Luke says, just as in the great flood in the days of Noah, and just as in the fire and brimstone in the days of Lot, so the unthinkable will occur in the last days. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. The sun will be darkened. Perhaps it's a solar eclipse. The moon will not give its light. Perhaps it's a lunar eclipse. Maybe like the one we'll see tonight. The stars will fall from the sky. The Greek word for stars is asteros. Maybe it's an asteroid event. <coughs> These kind of signs we've talked about, and, and, they're, and they're fairly familiar to us. Possibly it'll be something catastrophic and totally unfamiliar to us. I don't know. There are at least eight Old Testament references to this phenomena of the day of the Lord. You find them in Isaiah, Joel, Amos, Ezekiel, and Zephaniah. Probably the most descriptive is Isaiah 24, verses 21 to 23. <clears throat> So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. <coughs> then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and His glory will be before His elders. The host of heaven, the Lord will punish the host of heaven seems to equate with the powers of the air, meaning the rule of Satan. Well, let's read on in Matthew 24. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The unthinkable continues. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all will see the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming with power and great glory. Great power and great glory. And what is the response of the tribes of the earth? Interestingly enough, instead of Fear, it is mourning. Actually, the word is bewailing. To feel and express grief and sorrow. To regret deeply something that I've done because now it's coming back at me. It's different from repentance. Repentance is genuine sorrow over an offense that we've given to someone or to God. Mourning or bewailing is kind of a, a, a grief turn to yourself because of, the, because of the damage that it's going to cause you. There's an interesting play on words here between the verbs see and mourn. They see and they mourn. The future tense of the verb harao, or harao, meaning, meaning to see or observe, is apsonte. And the future tense of the verb kapto, which means to strike one's breast in lamentation, is kapsonte. So we have apsonte and kapsonte. I think Jesus did that on purpose. They will see and mourn. How much better to believe and then you can see and rejoice. You can see and welcome. But it'll be too late for the tribes of the earth. Their unbelief will have sealed their fate. 
Seeing Jesus coming will lead directly to beating their breasts in lamentation, just like opsomte sounds like copsomte. John's revelation speaks to the same event. <coughs> Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so, amen. Notice that all those who see him will mourn over him. Indeed, and included in those who see him are those who pierced him. Obviously, a reference to Jesus' suffering and death. But those who pierced Jesus himself died 2,000 years ago. And I can tell you their eyes no longer see. They're just a pile of dust somewhere in the earth. Those whose eyes can see are those who have recently executed the church the body of Christ. And something gives them cause to mourn. We'll look at this a bit closer in a moment. Let's read on with what Jesus said. And He will send forth His angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Remember the ordering of the events. Immediately after the tribulation of those days is when this event occurs. And it happens with the sound of a great trumpet. America's revolution was started with the figurative shot heard around the world. This will literally be the trumpet heard around the world. So just to recap, let's get the ordering of the events straight. First, the great affliction. Second, Jesus comes with power and great glory. And third, the angels gather together the elect. Who are the elect? They're the church. Chosen by God since the foundation of the world. Paul refers to the very same event in his famous gathering together scripture in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's obviously the same event Jesus <coughs> speaks of in Matthew 24, 31. It's the physical resurrection of the church. It'll be a noisy tumultuous event. By the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, the last enemy death will be defeated. The shout will be heard round the world. The trumpet blast will be heard round the world. And the unthinkable will continue. You remember how they will look upon Him whom they have pierced? This occurs after the tribulation of those days when most of the church has been executed. And now these saints are coming back to life. And they're being seen by the very ones who killed them. And they'll realize their great error. And they will mourn as they look upon the resurrected saints whom they have just murdered the body of Christ. Luke adds more detail to our understanding of the unfolding events of the end times. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth dismay among the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves men fainting from fear and the expectation of things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 
And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing nigh. <coughs> Don't you just love that? <laughs> but when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing nigh. The tribulation of those days and the war on the saints will be so oppressive that those who do survive will have their backs slumped and their heads bowed. It's a picture of weariness and desperation. Take heart, the Lord says, because those days will be quickly drawing to an end. Your redemption is drawing near. John's Revelation has an extensive description of the coming of the Lord. It's one of my favorite passages. Revelations 19, beginning in verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. And he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. The return of the king. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The first time he came, he came as the king of peace riding on a donkey. The second time that he comes, he comes as the mighty king of conquest, riding on a white horse. His robe is dipped in blood. <coughs> but we see here that when the king returns, he's not alone. So who's with him? <coughs> And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations. Who are these armies of heaven? <clears throat> They're identified by their clothing, by their uniforms. Armies march in a uniform. They're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And we've seen that uniform before, have we not? If you remember the fifth seal in Revelation 16 or 6:11, this is where the uniforms are issued to the souls under the altar. Because those, those souls under the altar were the slain because of the word of God says, and they were given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been should be completed also. Revelation 7, 9 says, the great multitudes standing before the throne and before the Lamb were clothed in their uniform, in their white robe. 713, those who are clothed in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? And the answer is in 714. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So let's read on about King Jesus. And He will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress, the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God 
in order that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat upon the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of him who sat upon the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. What would you give to ride with an army like that? Park just finished their annual Buffalo Roundup. I saw in the paper that they estimated the size of the crowd was 21,000 people to watch that thing. <clears throat> One of my responsibilities when I worked in the park was to select the Roundup crew each year for that event. So I developed a drawing system to ensure that at least some new people would have access to ride on the Roundup crew each year. And oh, the politics and the posture. <laughs> presumption and the unfounded promises that people would make and uh, then they would look to me to honor. <laughs> Those invitations to ride were a highly prized thing. They were the ticket to what a lot of people considered the ride of a lifetime, <laughs> rounding up those uh, 1,500 head of Buffalo into the parks corral system. And it was, it was, it got to be pretty western sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it was pretty whole hum. Friends, the round, the ride in Custer State Park to bring in 1,500 head of bison will seem like a little bitty carousel ride. <laughs> For a child compared to the ride of the, ride of the king. Mm -hmm. I wrote a poem about that once. I'm not going to torture you with one today. <laughs> <laughs> I called it the return of the king and in it I imagined what it was like to ride with the armies of heaven. But I'm going to have to rewrite it a bit because I missed the very best part. It was staring me in the face the whole time. And I just never really saw it. <coughs> but before we talk about that, there's another scripture that adds detail to our understanding of who this army is. Revelation 7, 4, 17, 14. It speaks of the beast and the false prophet who wage war against the Lamb. It said, these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with Him are the called and chosen and faithful. So who are those that are with Him? They're the called, the chosen, and the faithful. Who gets to ride? The called, the chosen, and the faithful. <coughs> but let me get to the best part, the part that I admitted in my poem. What happens as King Jesus assembles his army in the clouds just prior to the last battle? We read about it in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. You know, I don't know how many times I've read that passage at a funeral, people to look forward to the resurrection. I've never really thought about it before in relation to the army. The armies of heaven will be transformed. The trumpet of God, the war trumpet of God, will be heard round the world. The angels will gather the elect from the four winds, and the dead will be raised. The physical resurrection of the executed church will take place. The resurrection of the called, the chosen, and the faithful. And all those horsemen and horsewomen will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Changed into what? Paul said that we'll be raised imperishable, immortal. The entire army will be armed with resurrection bodies. Jesus will go to war against modern armies horseback with immortal soldiers. Jesus will face tanks and guns and bombs and aircraft and attack helicopters and it won't matter. His soldiers are invincible and he will slay them with the sword of his mouth, his word. The armies of this world can shoot those horse soldiers, they can nuke them, it doesn't matter. They're immortal. They're coming. And they keep coming. And there's nothing the tribes of this world can do about it. <clears throat> Thus, we will ever be with the Lord. Thus, in this way, <clears throat> we'll begin the rest of eternity. Wow. <coughs> Heidi, would you come and lead us in our last Please stand with me. What do you say after that, huh?
Jesus answer to the Sadducees as they asked him about the resurrection or challenged him about the resurrection? But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for neither can they die anymore. For they are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Will you be a son of the resurrection? <clears throat> Here's what's on your ticket to ride. <laughs> Called, chosen, and faithful. Is the Father calling you this morning? Will you respond to Him? You know how the story ends. And it's all true, every word. What's keeping you from wholeheartedly giving your life this morning to King Jesus? But the next question is a stern one. Will you be faithful? Even faithful unto death. Blessed are those who are faithful unto death. The second death cannot harm them. Cultivate faithfulness now while it is day before night comes when no man can work. Cultivate faithfulness to meet King Jesus every day. Cultivate faithfulness to get His Word into your life. Cultivate faithfulness in standing up for Him by telling your story. And they overcame Him the devil because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even to death. And cultivate faithfulness to His body, the church. We will need each other more than we know in the dark days ahead, just before the great victory.